Good morning. Good to be with all of you. Uh, I'm Nick. If we haven't met or if you're new, uh, a warm welcome to you. It's good to be together. There's definitely a popular side of the church, and I don't know what happened over here, but uh, but, uh, yeah, it's good to be together. Um, Just a few things, uh, a few notices. The first is uh, the International Food Festival is coming up soon. Uh, It's a big vibe, a Friday night uh, thing uh, where we have food together. So uh, 20th of October, put it in your diary, and there are two ways you can be involved. The first is you can cook an international dish or a dish of a particular uh, culture and uh, bring it along. Please sign up for that. There are clipboards on the glass table outside. Or you can come along on the night, buy a ticket, 50 rand at the door, and you get a sampling of several different dishes. And uh, the idea is that we learn something about the world we live in, and also that we uh, support our youth on the Crossword Camp. It's always loads of fun, uh, so please come along to that. Then, uh, our AGM is coming up soon, Sunday, 5 November. There are council nomination forms also on the glass table, so please think Uh, about who you might like to have serving on our church council and make a nomination. Then, uh, next Sunday, we have uh, something quite exciting happening. Our our presiding bishop-elect, our next presiding bishop, uh, Siegfried Ngubane, is in town and coming to preach. So uh, that's next Sunday. I can't remember what the date is next Sunday, but you will. Uh, So be there. We're the first church to host him uh, in his new role, so that's quite a cool thing. We're still the center of the universe. (laughs) Then the last thing I want to say before we get going is that this is not a very family-friendly PG piece of scripture or sermon. So if you have any kids that haven't gone off to Sunday school, you might want to send them along there, or you may want to have one of those important debriefing conversations that parents have to have with kids sometimes. Uh, when we're done. We get to, in, in the letter of First Thessalonians, uh, to what Paul calls other matters. Uh, it's uh, specific things that the apostle wants to address in the church at Thessalonica. He wants to address these things again, again because he says he already instructed them. Probably when he was with them, he's already instructed them in these matters. This is a second time round. Um, He says they're already living appropriately in these matters, but he wants them to do so more and more, more and more. And that's instructive. Uh, Even if you're doing okay on on what we're speaking about today and you don't feel there's any any massive crisis in your life, there's always room for improvement. Anyone here been watching the World Cup? Sure you have. What's the ultimate coach's cliche? The journalist asks about the game, and what does the coach say? Yeah, plenty of work-ons from today, lots of room for improvement. Yeah, well, exactly. There's plenty of room for growth, and the apostle wants us to grow more and more. But especially when the subject matter is sex. Verses 3 to 8, honestly... Who in the room today couldn't, could say honestly that they've got that thing sorted out, that their desires and mindset and actions are all uh, you know, pure and holy and right and all good regarding sex? There's plenty of room for growth. And when our subject matter is uh, sibling love, brotherly and sisterly love, as it is in verses 9 to 12, I think any coach... <laughs> And each one of us would agree there's plenty of room for growth. Uh, We can live uh, more and more in line with what these verses have to say. So let's pray for help and we'll dig in properly. Heavenly Father, we ask that like the Thessalonians this morning, we would be taught by God. And Father, we pray that like like the Thessalonians, we would be called to holiness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's deal with the first verses, uh, verses 3 to 8. Sex and holiness. Our problems in this area are great. 
Our society's problems in this area are great. The battles we fight are great. Of course, sex is good and it's created uh, by God with good purposes. Um, but it's equally obvious that our, our cultures and in our society, we have stuffed it up. On the one hand, we live in a sex-crazed culture. On the other hand, so many of us live with traumas and so many of us with regrets, uh, with hurt. It's a whole mess. Sexual obsession is everywhere on our TVs, on our cell phones, uh, always just one click away. It's in advertising. And it's probably in our heads, in our hearts, and in our homes. Uh, sexual violence is in our news. A graphic, horrible reports never end. It's nothing new, unfortunately. Nothing new. Uh, there is an ancient uh, philosopher and writer, observer of the Roman world called Demosthenes. There's a great name for your, uh, for your kid one day. Demosthenes. He's describing Roman culture, the culture to which Paul writes this letter. He says, this is how we live. We keep mistresses for pleasure, concubines for day-to-day -day bodily needs, but we have wives to produce legitimate children and serve as guardians of our homes. That's, whoa. That's sort of what was accepted as the way to do things in, uh, in the Roman world. And actually it pretty well describes our city and our time. In the time of so much so-called freedom and liberation to do whatever you want, with whomever you want, whenever you want, the, it's just about the only time it's frowned upon is when, it's, when sex is not between two consenting adults. Uh, but not just around us, let's also be, be honest about ourselves. It's easy, easy to fall to the kind of thinking that says that freedom or liberation is, is good and, and it brings pleasure. There's a temptation for us to desire it in our hearts and to act on it uh, with, with cell phones, with people, with porn. Uh, but the essential call in the, in the passage is to holiness. Look at chapter 3, verse 13. We're going uh, one verse back. This is Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes. There's that word holy. And he picks up on that word holy as he moves forward. So chapter 4, verse 3 it is God's will that you should be sanctified. The word sanctified hides something. It's really the same word as holy. To be sanctified is to be holified or consecrated. So Paul is concerned that the Thessalonians, that we uh, become holy more and more. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy, and honorable. The word comes up again in verse 7, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. And in verse 8, the very God who gives you his holy spirit. Now, the Thessalonians in their sexualized culture, the South Africans in our sexualized culture, called to be holy. Holy. Now, if we were to play a game of word association here this morning, I won't ask you to shout out any words. That could get embarrassing. Uh, but if we were to play a game of word association and we say, what words, positive words, go with sex? I wonder what we'd say. Maybe, um, maybe we'd say some words to do with safety, like consensual or safe sex. Maybe we'd use some words to do with love and so on, like committed or passionate or loving Maybe we'd use words like pleasure or freedom or self-expression or whatever. All, all words that we usually would associate, positive words we'd usually associate with sex. But interesting that the apostle thinks that the word that goes with sex is holy. Holy. 
because uh, that has some type of connotations for us, right? When I hear the word holy, I'm thinking of like maybe a monastery, right? <laughs> and, uh, and self-denial. Uh, yeah, definitely, uh, I'm thinking along the lines of stepping out of a big free world of possibility and exploration into a very small, dried up little experience called holiness. Hey? That's certainly what it sounds like. Uh, something small and restricted and maybe just a little bit sad. So let's think about what holiness is. And we could start in the Old Testament. Maybe one of the famous passages in which the word holy is used is Isaiah chapter 6, where there's a vision of the throne of God, famous vision. And as Isaiah sees uh, what it is like in God's throne, there are seraphim covering their eyes and their feet and crying out, Holy, holy, holy. So God is holy. It's not just a character trait. It's not like uh, he's a whole lot of things, including holy. Holiness is uh, part of his existence. It's, it's more like who he is than it is like what he's like. He's high above us. Otherly, different, and, and above us in, in, in moral rightness uh, and in, in the way he exists. He is holy. He just is holy. Uh, and, and anything or anyone or any space or any time that is called holy is holy because God has called it holy. So God has this thing called holiness. He is holiness. And anything he calls holy is holy. It's holy because it belongs to Him. It's holy because it is for Him now, dedicated to Him. So we could think, for example, of the temple in the Old Testament. The temple, there's space that is holy. Why is it holy? Because God has called it holy, and it's for Him and for His worship. And all the items that fill the temple, the candle stands and the whatever else that's in the temple, are holy. Why? Because God has called them to Himself and, to his, and for service of Him and for His worship. And the priests are holy for all the same reason, right? What is holy is that which is belonging to God and for God. Now we can better understand what we read when we read verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified or that you should be made holy. Of course, uh, Paul narrows down the meaning of this in the second half of the verse. That you should avoid sexual immorality. Holiness is this big idea that we belong to God, that we've been consecrated to Him, called uh, to His worship, for His worship. And Paul says that part of that means, uh, means cutting out what everyone else thinks is just normal, sexual immorality. You know how often we think about the question, what is God's will for my life? It's a big loaded phrase. We want to do God's will uh, in so many different ways. Well, I can tell you I know definitively what God's will is for your life. I read it in Scripture. It's your sanctification. So that you should be holy. Look at verse 4. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. We can see there how holiness has the sense of being different, not like the Gentiles or the pagans who do not know God. There's, something, there's to be something different, holy and honorable. The idea in the beginning of the verse is that you must get a grip, get a hold of yourself. <laughs> Take hold of your body. Uh, live in self-control. However, we're not called to any of this in our own strength. Verse 7, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Call, that's an important word. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen those toddler tethers? Okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, think like a, a, a leash for a dog. You know what I mean? 
but on the other end isn't a dog, it's a toddler. <laughs> Parents help themselves feel better about the situation by calling it a, a tether, but it, it is in the end the same thing as a leash. Now, I have great sympathy for the use of these things. I'll tell you why, because I also have a toddler, and when you call them, they, it's, you know, pointless. Uh, we love them, and they're sweet, and they smile, but come back from the edge of the pool. It's just meaningless, meaningless to a toddler. You know what I'm talking about. Many of you have been, in fact, we've all been toddlers, so we should remember being on the other side of that as well. Now, that's exactly not what the Apostle Paul means by the word call. That's exactly not what he means when he says in verse 7, God did not call us. The word call in the Bible, and especially when Paul uses it, is an effective call. It's like a call that goes out with the energy to bring it about, as though, as though the, the very sounds of the call come with the power to bring about the calling. A call, the word call has to do with our salvation. God calls us into salvation, and when He calls, we come. That's how calling works all over the Bible. And so this is an effective call, an effective call in the life of the believer. God did not call us to impurity, but His effective call, the call that works, the call that brings about that which it asks for, was a call to live a holy life. <laughs> you see, God has already done what we need. It's not just in our own strength. It's not just by our own moral wills or power, by the force of our, our self-control. It's by God's grace. He has called, and we must walk in line with His call. When we sin in the area of sex... Uh, we're not just breaking some sort of frumpish, old-fashioned rule from a long time ago, arbitrary and weird. We're living at odds with God's call, His call to holiness. Holiness uh, is not like stepping out of a world of possibility and pleasure and freedom and into a small, little, insignificant, shriveled-up monastic lifestyle. Now, holiness is the bigger and the fuller life. God is holy. <laughs> God is holy. And His life is quite something. He is the source of life. <laughs> and to live in His holiness is to have a life that is a little bit more like His life. That's bigger and better, not smaller and lesser. Uh, and God's will God's will is that we should be made holy, that we should be sanctified. Now, now, come along with me on a thought experiment. Imagine, just imagine for a second there is a God. He is holy and He's loving. Imagine with me, He cared so much about us that He had a will for us. He, he was concerned about how we lived our lives and, and His will was loving and good. Imagine with me that God revealed His will to us. Would we not instantly say, hmm, that God, He would know about the best life. His will would be better than my will. Hmm? God's will is holiness. And so what God wants, holiness, is better than what the world wants us to want. We have to believe that. The bigger life, the fuller life, the more joyful and pleasure-filled life is the life that belongs to God, consecrated to His use and His worship in holiness. And that includes what we do when the curtains are drawn and when the cell phones are out and when we're in private. So let's get uncomfortably close to home. <laughs> uh, this can be a bit embarrassing, but we're going to do it anyway. We think about our cell phones. You know on your cell phone you're only ever about two or three clicks away from actual pornography. I don't have a, a real statistic on that, but I'm pretty sure that must be true. Whole life holiness, including holiness in the area of sex, is better and more fruitful and joyful than the rubbish you can so easily find on your cell phone. 
It's so quick and so easy and so anonymous to go there. But holiness is better. We have some teenagers with us. You know, uh, you all know what your peers say uh, and what they think and what they watch and what they would like to be doing. You know how often sex is on their minds. God's word says that he calls teenagers, all Christians including teenagers, to belong to him in holiness. Uh, That is his will. That is the best way to live out your teenage years. So don't make a mess of this now. (laughs) You must believe that the best life, the fullest life, is a life of holiness. If you've made a mess already, you should speak about it and confess it and put it in the past where it belongs. And to all who are unmarried, whether you're single and unmarried, or romantically involved and unmarried, or dating and unmarried, Yo, this, this is hard. This is hard in our world that makes you look stupid for the lifestyle you choose to live as a Christian. The holy life unto God is better than the life of sexual immorality, of fornication and lust. Do you believe that? <laughs> Do you believe it? In the end, your actions will follow what you believe. And what about all those who are married? You've learned by now that getting married doesn't fix all the problems. Perhaps it's so easy to wonder from time to time about unfaithfulness or to hide away in secret sin or to consider giving up on the whole thing because of sex. (laughs) Do you believe? I'm not calling you to believe something about your spouse, actually. I'm calling you to believe something about God. Do you believe that holiness, a life consecrated to the worship of God, is fuller and better and more joyful than some sexual fantasy or exploration. It is better. Our fantasies are naive and stupid. But we need to believe it. And our actions and our desires will follow what we believe. And all the many who sit here today broken and regretful. (laughs) And uh, I I guess there there are probably few of us for whom that doesn't apply. You know, there's a past that you hate. You wish it never happened. This morning has been difficult because you remember what happened. I'm sorry it's been difficult. Uh, But there's good news. (laughs) You're rescued. You're rescued. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 describes Christians who the, as those who are rescued. We're rescued from the mess we've made in the past or the way we've been made a mess in the past. And we're rescued from the wrath of God that is coming. That is good news. The Lord Jesus died to rescue us from the guilt of our sin. The Lord Jesus rose again to put us back together again in new creation. You know Humpty Dumpty? All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again? The little egg that broke into a thousand pieces? (laughs) Good news, the Lord rose so that we could be put back together again in new life. Okay, has everyone taken a deep breath? (laughs) We're moving on. Verse 9, now about your love for one another, okay? Now about your love for one another. That indicates a change of subject. He's moving on from the subject of sex and holiness to love for one another. And the word love for one another is actually one word in the original language of the Bible. It's a compound word. It combines two words. The first word is the word for a sibling, a brother or a sister, And the second word is the word for love, one of the words for love. Um, Actually, I've got it the other way around. It's first love and then the word for a sibling, but who cares, right? The point is, this is not just a love one person for another. This is the love siblings share, family love. Uh, 
the love, uh, the love between a brother and a sister, a brother and a brother, a sister and a sister. Again, different from what's around us, middle class life gives us an overinflated desire for an individualistic kind of independence. We don't like needing anybody. We're allergic to that. And it gives us a consumer mindset. We think we can fix all of our problems with money. And whenever we have a problem, the first thing we think about is how much money it will require to change the problem. And we have a productivity mindset, which means we fill our calendars to the brim. Come on, you know you do this. What's Monday to Friday looking like next week? We fill our calendars to the brim with stuff to do, and there's no margin for people. Uh, the instruction is completely different. Love each other like family. More than hello, how's it going on Sunday kind of love. Love each other like family. Um, it's interesting what kind of shape this love takes as he gets uh, more specific in verses 11 to 12. Uh, in fact, before we get to that, let me just say, verses 11 and 12 are still under the subject of love for one another. Uh, he gets to a, a new subject in verse 30 about those who sleep in death. You see it there in, in uh, verse 13. But in verse 11 and 12, he's still on the subject of love one for another, of sibling love. But look how it gets specific. Uh, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Uh, okay, a common way of life in the empire called Rome was uh, what they call a patron-client relationship. So there was a very wealthy, very generous person who got a whole lot of people who needed their generosity to do their bidding for them, right? So a whole bunch of people kind of didn't exactly work for the wealthy patron, but, but in exchange for their gifts, there were certain expectations made of them to uphold their honor and speak well of them, maybe take care of their business, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that was a problem in the Thessalonian church. It seems like it, judging from the words Paul uses here. Uh, in any case, what he wants them to do is avoid that kind of dependency, that particular kind of dependency, and to get quietly busy with their own work. Uh, don't be a busybody spreading someone else's honor. Get busy with your work. Get a job, do the job, and earn your own money. That's really as simple as it is. <laughs> um, Two reasons you should do this. Verse 12, it's respectable to outsiders. In other words, it adorns the gospel. It makes the, the community the gospel has brought about to look proper and good and respectable. And secondly, you don't have to rely on the charity of the church or of some benefactor, some uh, patron. Two good reasons, to get a job, do the job, and earn some money. But let's be merciful and also honest at the same time. We don't live in the easiest time, in the easiest place to do that. It's not actually easy today to get a job, do the job, and earn some money. Uh, the unemployment rate, I haven't looked at for a while, but it's scary, especially among youth. And then on top of that, even for those who are employed, the minimum wage is... A minimum wage I'm not sure it's entirely a living wage so it's not very easy uh, to do this let's be merciful in the way we engage with each other as a church we must always be generous nonetheless the passage is very helpful very helpful indeed notice I recognize that scream I hope you'll be okay <laughs> uh, there are Notice with me, there's no kind of heady, pie-in-the-sky, highfalutin ideas about work in this passage. It's really grounded. Think about our culture, and now I have to have specific words for those who belong more or less to my age, okay? But just think about our culture. Um, we think our work must be something we're passionate about, uh, an expression of our interests, 
and our flair, uh, of our personality, even an expression of ourselves. We, we must get fulfillment from our work. <laughs> That's a really high expectation, very seldom met, very impractical. Um, it's really obviously good to get some degree of fulfillment from your work. Obviously, it's good to work on something you actually like doing. That's a bonus. Uh, on the contrary, our text is so day-to-day, -day, so grounded and practical. Really, find work, do the work so you can make a living, so that you don't have to be unhealthily independent on somebody, and so that the church can give its generosity to somebody else. And so that the gospel is adorned and made to look respectable. That makes sense, you know? Like, we can do that thing. <laughs> Notwithstanding what I said earlier about the society we live in and the, and the, and the difficulty in, in the workplace and all of that stuff, yet really practical, a much more day-to-day uh, -day and doable mindset for work. It is good to do any work. It is good to earn a living from the work that you do, and the rest is a bonus. Why do we work? Why does, what context does all of this come in? It's loving. It's loving because you don't make yourself dependent on anybody. Why do we work? We work because we love. Okay, now I'm going to bring us to a very abrupt end. Uh, we've said a lot of things about a lot of things. And you might feel the need to debrief. That's okay. We're going to take communion in a second. And we'll get the opportunity to debrief in the context of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to sing some songs. And it will give us the opportunity to take some deep breaths as we sing the wonderful glories of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's time for me to say amen. Uh, so let us pray. Father, we ask this morning that you would teach us holiness and call us to holiness. Father, we ask this morning that you would teach us to love and that you would call us to love. With great power do so, we pray.